So thank you so much, everyone, for being here. For us in BC, it is the afternoon. For everybody else, it might be the evening, the morning. But I would like to welcome everyone to the Master of Educational Technology at UBC's Anti-Racism Speaker Series. My name is Dr. Carrie Ewart. I am the coordinator for EDI and Community Outreach, as well as a lecturer for the Master of Educational Technology program, what we call here MET at UBC, and one of the designers and coordinators for the Anti-Racism Speaker Series, along with faculty member in curriculum and pedagogy, and last year's director of MET and my colleague, Dr. Samia Khan. And as we start, I would like to begin with a land acknowledgement. As an uninvited non-Indigenous person, I would like to acknowledge that I recognize I work and teach and meet here today with you through UBC's lens on the unceded traditional territories of the Musqueam and Squamish nations. And I acknowledge our traditional hosts and honor and welcome graciously to the people to seek the knowledge that we do here. So myself as an ally in this work, I commit to the ongoing research, my self-education about Indigenous ways of learning, knowing, and doing, and decolonizing our practice, and recognize that in the profession of education, that we have profound roots in um, colonialism, violence, and acknowledge our responsibility as the coordinator for EDI and community outreach and graduate studies uh, educational practitioner to meaningfully engage in the ongoing process of disrupting this normalized and what has become this systemic structure so that we can decolonize and um, participate in anti-racism work. Okay, so please feel free if you would like to share your own land acknowledgement in the chat area, we welcome that. And we urge everyone to continue to decolonize your work and be mindful about the purpose of this land acknowledgement and what it means to recognize Indigenous peoples, cultures, traditions, territories, spaces, and materials as a means of transforming dialogue into action. So who are we at the MET program? We are the Master of Educational Technology program, which is a graduate studies program in the Faculty of Education at UBC that educates professionals on the use and impact of digital learning technologies. All right, I think we're, Helena, if you can do two slides up now, please. And the purpose of the speaker series is to acknowledge the commitment to every educator and individual that we have to be inclusive and to address systemic racism. So with a focus on anti-Indigenous, anti-Black, anti-people of color racism, the series speaks to identify the responsibility that educators and leaders have to facilitating and supporting anti-racist approaches, strategies for truth, redress and reconciliation within their practice to enhance and transform learning environments and learning cultures with a specific directive being on digital technologies and presenters will discuss like the one today, uh, anti-racism and tools to support equity, diversity, inclusion, decolonization and anti-racism in a changing dynamic of this digital age. So we ask for you to participate in this call to action, which is our next slide. And the reason why we ask for this call to action is so often we see these speaker series and these presentations and we listen and we're excited about the work, but then nothing happens with this. So we invite all the attendees of this particular presentation today to make one change to really listen to the content and to think about the next steps of um, eradicating racism through reconciliation, allyship and community building. And we will talk about that a little bit more at the end of our session. I do want to say that this is being recorded, this presentation, so that it's available to all um, afterwards as well. And that we will be using the tool Slido. It's an app for you to ask questions throughout the presentation. Um, I think our GAA uh, member Helena will be putting it up on the chat area for everybody to access. And as the presentation is going on, please post your questions there and we'll address those at the end. So it is my great pleasure to introduce you to today's speaker. We have with us 
Zoe Brannigan Pipe, and a lot of you who were in our summer institute would know of the work that Zoe's been doing on inclusive making and 21st century competency development and creating spaces of inclusion. So Zoe's teaching methods are most influenced by John Dewey, Reggio Amelia methods, and Seymour Papert. And for those who don't know, Seymour Papert is considered the father of making and maker spaces. And these are all strong proponents of teaching and learning through inquiry, exploration, making, doing, play, and real world experiences. So Zoe has known for her creative classroom instructional methods, which support an environment that is inclusive, safe, and encourages others to take risks, that real maker mentality. She endeavors to create an environment for students to be themselves, be creative, critical thinkers, be passionate, self-directed, and ongoing learners, and accept mistakes as opportunities to grow. Zoe is robust and a resilient leader with a strong ability to empower and build capacity in others, and she is most excited when given the opportunity to work on projects that have real-world connections to and inspire community partnerships with a focus on equity and social justice. Zoe blogs, she tweets, and she uses YouTube to discuss equity and social justice in community matters, 21st century learning and health and fitness. She is presently a full-time teacher for the gifted program at the Hamilton Wentworth District School Board in Ontario. And when she has received the um, Profiling of Excellence Award for Innovation and Creativity, Zoe is also the teacher education accreditation coordinator, that is a mouthful in itself, writer and course reviewer at Brock University in the Faculty of Education. So that is enough from me, Zoe, without further ado, I would love to pass it over to you and the warmest welcome to you. We're very excited to hear what you have to say on inclusive maker spaces. Thank you very much. I'm gonna share my screen now, if that's okay. Okay. Okay, well, uh, that was such a warm welcome. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, everyone, for being here. It is um, such an important topic, uh, one that's impacting all of us. And uh, this call to action, um, it, it is very inspiring uh, that we are all here doing this um, and having these conversations. So um, as you all know, I am a full time teacher. And so what I'm going to show you um, today is a little bit of my story uh, from that perspective. So, um, sorry, I'm just, uh, so in the session um, that uh, I just wanted to share from the onset of my career, I want to kind of give you some explanation here. Um, as a teacher, I've always tried to find and use tools that engage all learners. Uh, it's sort of that universally designed differentiated instruction that we're all so familiar with. So in 2008, uh, that seems so long ago, <laughs> I finally had access to wireless internet in my classroom. Can you believe it? And for me, that was something very different, right? I'd had already been teaching for several years, um, but the internet in itself, um, that is what changed my ideas about what education could be because all of a sudden we were opening up windows and doors and you know that brick and mortar idea of education um, was changing. My, um, my first day of school, I think it, you know at that time uh, we used Skype and we measured 90,000 kilometers, 20 countries um, in terms of, of, you can see the Google map there on the screen and um, and, it, and really the idea was getting students connected with others. That was the work we were doing is that if we want to look at equity and inclusion and having kids understand the world around them, they really truly needed to understand. So I started experimenting with tools, program and initiatives. And again, it just kept coming down to that learning space, that learning environment. Um, it's safe to say that what we all want for our kids, our students, um, our own children, is for them to be engaged, to discover joy in learning, to work to their ability. And as an educator, uh, we in order to do that, all students need to belong. We all need to have them belong. And in order for them to belong, we would, as a group, 
um, need to help each one of them get recognized culture. So how can we create a space and an environment where all students want to do this, want to learn with passion? Um, so I, uh, uh, in this session, I want to share some strategies for anyone that is interested in enhancing an inquiry-driven classroom that emphasizes maker culture, student-centric learning, social justice, and, um, and I want us to look at all of this through the lens of anti-racist and anti-oppressive teaching. Some of the ideas I'm going to present is going to seem a little bit utopian in nature. Um, really thinking like, how can you actually do this in the classroom? But it does, it, all it really just does, it, it takes us, uh, it, it takes a different way of looking at how we organize and operationalize education institutions. And if anything, I hope you as educators that are out there, parents, researchers, leaders, um, take away the idea that we just need more people supporting a different way of teaching and learning in public education. And, and that the only way we can do that is to support um, th this advance and research some of the ideas that I'm going to be sharing. Um, so I, I also want to reflect on equity work in general, and that I, I think that to and truly engage in the work of anti-racism and anti-oppression, um, I, I listened to some of the other speakers in this series, and to truly be culturally responsive, we need to feel uncomfortable at times. Um, we need to question um, some of the more familiar ways, more common ways of, of things that we're doing. Um, the, the, the organizations that we have worked through ourselves and could come up we need they work for us right a lot of us because that's we're here um, but they're not working um, in an equitable way for a lot of people and so we need to question these expectations of others uh, and and so on um, i <clears throat> all right i'm just gonna uh, share I have little notes in my um, in my presentation where I'm saying pause, breathe, and so on. Um, in 2016, my teaching team, um, one of them are here, in fact, uh, hello, Beth. <laughs> um, we created a makerspace which won uh, the Ken Spencer Award. There is a video online you can watch, and it does a little bit of a walkthrough of this makerspace. It was a CEA award. And um, the award set in motion the funding for further research, which resulted in my Master of Education thesis. And it resulted in a uh, creation of, second, of a second makerspace. Um, but just like many of you out there, when you start doing research and you start kind of conducting your own project, it doesn't always turn out as predicted. And the direction shifted from creating a maker space, like you see um, in this picture right here, it shifted into more of the learning environment and anti-oppressive teaching and inclusive learning spaces that then had a focus on maker space. So it, the maker space became second. The presentation here tonight is the narrative of this experience um, of my research of some of the reflections on creating of an inclusive learning environments that use makerspace and play because we often bring play into that space and connect learning to the community um, to enhance um, equity in learning so i'm sharing the story of innovation and teaching and learning and about pushing boundaries and I hopefully will push some of your boundaries tonight by doing things differently and thinking big and testing limits, taking risks and so on. So first, uh, I want to briefly talk about the word makerspace. Makerspace. So um, it's a seen as a 21st century innovative concept describing a space where people can meet and share and collaborate and invent, uh, use hands on approaches and so on. We often define it as this do it yourself movement involving technology, but but it also involves other things, right? Like textiles and paintbrushes and knitting needles and crochet and, and sewing machines and so on. And I sort of spent this last decade examining the content and processes and guiding pedagogies of makerspaces in education. 
and using these alternative forms of education. And, and it was mentioned at the beginning, like Reggio Emilia and Waldorf and Montessori approaches, which helped me explore this sort of culture of making and hands-on and experiential learning. But I soon also learned and realized from the work we were doing that we were also looking into indigenous worldviews, um, ways of knowing. Um, there are many layers, including the students' lived experiences, their heritage, their family context, their communities. That's what I wanted to bring into the makerspace environment. I, I wanted to show you this picture. What you see here um, is a picture of me. Um, I was about seven years old, I guess, at the time at a rally. And I grew up in a family that strongly supports activism um, and anti-racist uh, practices. So I was very fortunate to be surrounded by this um, from a young age. And I learned a work that the work of equity means for a lot of us um, that especially for those of us who are already in a position of power or privilege over another group, that it may, may need sometimes for us to give something up, right? Give up our time, give up space, giving up money. Sometimes it's a position, it's an opportunity, it's, it's a discomfort if we're giving up that um, in order to conduct this work. And we talk about this call to action and what is it that you are going to do to uh, make sure that you're 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 engaging um, through that discomfort, and in some instances, it means it means doing something that maybe you've never done before. So, I'm approaching how we teach and design learning opportunities. Consider thinking about what you're going to do differently. So, I value and embrace digital computer-based tech-oriented. And if anybody knows me or see my blog or tweets or you know, you've ever read any of the things that perhaps I've talked about, um, you know that that has been very important, especially when it comes to um, differentiated instruction and, and people using tools they need to. But for me, it's more important the learner first has a strong sense of self and others, a sense of the community, and it provides us that opportunity for choice. Providing an opportunity where the learners feel belonging and inclusion, that's what a makerspace should be grounded on, um, right? So the community is first, the makerspace is second. It's more than just having a lesson, um, that one-off or an activity or a workshop. It speaks to sort of our senses, our wellness, our community, our the, the, the feel, the sound, the touch, the taste, all of those things need to be part of that makerspace. And so I want you to think about, you know, how this space matters for you in your, in your work uh, when we're addressing racism in our systems and our organizations. And so what does it look like in action? In in some ways, at the root of how we're educating our children today, I, I would say, and, and I heard Carrie talk a little bit about this as well, when we're trying to decolonize, that's something that I wanted to bring into my learning environment is, how, is decolonize um, a lot of what we do. And a lot of the root of what we're doing, pardon me, is going back to a time, a, a time sometimes even before the technology that we're using, that we use in our makerspace, a time before perhaps standardized education, before we were caught up in tests and, and assessments. Um, uh, it was when making um, and, and participating in that maker cu culture was a, something necessary for us to learn. I, I seek to learn from indigenous um, peoples about their worldviews in education and learning prior to colonization prior to residential school systems. I want to know what learning looked like then. I want to know, um, you know, what learning could look like um, from other cultures and communities that um, are, are different than our own in Western civilizations. We tend to have a clear view about what we think education should look like, but maybe we need to start thinking differently. And obviously, yes, um, we have progressed in many, many wonderful ways. And I'm very, and I use that progress, progress to you know, enhance inclusion, but I think we've lost a lot as we know when trying to standardize education. Um, and I know that we, we 
all know that people have suffered and lost, and that's why we're doing the work that we're doing today. So I'm going to share some brief examples of how this might look in action, and I want you to keep an eye, um, you know, a, an open mind, I guess, as we move forward. So before, I guess I haven't really asked any of you, or you know, I know that Carrie, Carrie did that a little bit at the beginning, but um, what do you think equity feels like? Like it would, or it, or and we look at that word equity, anti-racism, anti-oppression. What does it feel like? I I don't have the um, the chat open, but if you'd like to use the chat, it's a pretty big question. I mean, when when you feel equity, do do you feel something different? Do you feel different than you you know? Have you ever not felt equity? I don't know. Could we pause a moment and and just bring that in the chat? I, maybe somebody could help facilitate or is that possible i'm just curious as to what people think equity yeah. feels like <laughs> we can open it up right now it's disabled but we can okay. open it up for this just briefly because they, these are questions i've done and i've worked with and i'll explain in a minute um with the project we did um with some university uh project students but yeah i'm curious of what what you think equity actually feels like It should be open now if people can if try. If not, we can go on if people are kind we of have, asking what she means or. Nope, uh, I can read out what people have. We have feeling valued, everyone's needs are met. Elation. So. Like, I mean, we can use, it's great that you have the chat open now because you can certainly use the chat a couple of times. I will ask you um, just to kind of think about that because sometimes we we know what we know what some of the research says. We know what pe what equity doesn't feel like. Sometimes it's hard to recognize what equity feels like. Um, when I'm designing a space, I'm very, very, con a space for learning. I'm very conscious of, um, of equity and what it feels like for the person who, who might be learning. But I'm also very conscious that am I designing that based on what my views are, about what my upbringing bringing is, about my, my individual culture or where I'm from, or am I designing the space uh, looking at their needs? So I want to recognize that I believe in group work and I believe in, in the group dynamic as, as that's a big part of maker culture, but I also want to recognize those quiet individuals um, that um, that may need certain space. Uh, you see here, there's a couple little pictures up here of some students working, um, you know, on their own, um, looking at things like wellness and anxiety and, and the kinds of environment and, and what brings on, if you think about the anxiety and learning, we talk a lot about right now wellness and anxiety in, in schools and, and how kids are feeling and social emotional learning, but why often are they coming feeling that way equity is a big part of it inclusion it, feeling feeling that, that they're not their their needs are not being met um, is a big part of that so um the feel of a maker space uh, i'm sure you've heard the term low floor high ceiling but that's a become a big a favorite of mine and that any student at any age or any interest, any culture, uh, doesn't matter what they look like, um, what their background is, uh, but they need to be able to feel that they can be engaged and learning in that environment. The ceiling is high, um, they can take it to any level, but anybody can enter. And I often think of it as sort of a kindergarten room and, you know, but a kindergarten room that can adhere to all people. Uh, it also means that we create scenarios that are open and flexible for our learners, especially when we ourselves may not understand or have knowledge um, about them. So we can create lessons, activities. We all do, right? We create lessons and activities based on our knowledge, our experiences. Well, and we have good intentions when we do that, but maybe are we missing opportunity to be culturally responsive when we do that? And so we have to start giving a little of our does that comfort that we have and wanting things to be a certain way in order to be culturally responsive so 
that means your lessons and your teaching should be more open and flexibility and choice based and having that low floor and that high ceiling approach can do this um, in, um, so uh, this picture you see um, here is uh, is a picture that um, my my colleague and I who is here right now, Beth actually, um, we were we created something called an open classroom. And so it's just a regular classroom, regular environment, but we wanted it to be open so that all people could come, all ages, um, anyone could come and be involved in this learning environment. And it was pretty powerful uh, because it, it, it's like that saying, like, if you build it, they will come. They came. <laughs> it, it came in so much that, unfortunately, I'm not even doing it anymore because it was too much. It, 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 we weren't ready for the amount of people that just wanted to be together and to be able to join this, um, this, this community. So. Um, a successful maker culture environment within a school needs to be a space where true relationship building uh, collaboration is at the center so that we get to know the people that we are working with. If we want to engage in anti-racism um, and inclusion and equity, then how we need to know the people that are around us. We, we need to have these, be able to have these open conversations in education. And as I mentioned, I'm coming from a classroom teacher perspective. So it's something that is an ongoing conversation. The feel of the space needs to adhere to learners of all ages. So this is this is what you see right here on the screen. This is our this is this is instead of classroom desks. This is kind of that space, you know. And, and as you can see, it's it's all sorts of ages, people, um, you know, sitting comfortably, knitting, crocheting. They in they're making. They're they're but they're also creating community. And I wonder if this kind of thing is possible in your own classroom, uh, regardless of what you teach, can you create curriculum lessons that are inclusive to all learners? Knitting is a great example of the same concepts that can be used in coding and programming. Um, it's just that for some, it may be that first step. Um, so I'm gonna share some examples of how we use these style of lessons in the makerspace that you may not see as being tech-centric, but um they um they can they can certainly support um learners of all 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 kinds there are many types of maker spaces so I'm, I'm wondering actually if we could use a chat briefly again and um i'm curious as to what kind of maker spaces you've ever used or you've integrated in your own learning so i mean i i think of it as like there's a dedicated maker space where you walk in and the room is a maker space or a portable lending library that it could be or a maker space station um, there could be a maker space cart um, maybe uh, an area in a library or a garage um, that kind of thing but to bring this philosophy or this pedagogy into actual practice in the mainstream education, there has to be a bigger context than just the making, uh, a deeper context, more than the projects, um, the tools or the equipment that we're that we love and we play and we enjoy all of that. But there's still got to be a bigger context if we're going to bring that into a world right now where we're trying to make change and make impact. So anyone, I'm curious, like what what are your what is your maker sp space could. Carrie, can you help me again here? Yes, I can. So just while people are writing those, I'll go back to a couple of those um, responses to the question that you had asked before, um, saying that having a voice, equity feels like everyone gets what they need to be who they are and participate, that there's no judgment, that there's belonging, seeing every culture represented or represented in ways and humanizing wow uh, yep <laughs> i guess i don't need to do the rest of this presentation then <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so it says i love hearing you talk about low tech and knitting embroidery because a lot of the maker spaces feel too geared towards technology but our group of consultants really advocate for a variety, especially low tech. Two weeks ago, all participants ended up learning to crochet and it was great getting to know everyone while learning and teaching to crochet. Wow. 
I, whoever said that, that, I mean, that's popper right there, right? That's like, you're, you know, being involved in making and constructing while you're learning. It, it's huge. This one says I'm working on it for now. I have boxes full of materials that I pull out when I do making activities. Nice. Okay. Um, so I'm just, I'm going to keep going here and, and of course use the chat and I'd love to hear this because I think the real learning is this community that's in this room, but um, I, I, this has got to be one of my favorite pictures, right? And it, it's the support and the mentorship of, of an adult, of an elder um, supporting um, a child. It's, it's a way that that relationship's being built because if the, the talk of anti-racism, it's a pretty deep difficult conversation because we're approaching content that um that that dealt with a lot of violence and it's upsetting and it's things that we're going to be bringing into the conversation with children and in order to be able to have these kinds of conversations we need to create or set up an environment where it feels safe and i know that you had mentioned that that's something that we had already talked about so i hope you see in in the end my point here is that a maker space has to be an environment that's inclusive um, and it's fully and completely there to engage all learners. Um, and, and we need to put in an explicit effort into building that, that trust in there. Um, so <laughs> what is uh, in, in that um, particular, what is the, um, the role of health and wellness in a learning environment? So, this is a big one for me as well, is uh, the health and, and wellness. And I know that you mentioned that in my introduction right there. So I wanted to share a little bit on that, um, that it's a great way to relax, uh, sorry. Ah, something just, sorry, my, my computer. So what you see right here um, is, uh, is students who are, uh, basically, um, it's our gathering spot in the morning, um, you know, it's like the bell work that often teachers will do. Um, however, in this particular makerspace environment, students are sipping on a cup of hot tea, they're sharing um, in conversation, they're talking, they're thinking about the day ahead. Each of them are contributing um, in this, this picture here, uh, we were doing um, a crock pot of chili, but I think this practice is not often allowed. It depends on the school or the district. Um, so you should check your health and safety rules. Um, <laughs> right, Beth? <laughs> because, um, but, but we need to advocate because, and I'll explain why and what, wh how, where I'm going with this in a second, but they're valuable life skills um, for kids, but it's more than that. Um, it's an intentional to give kids that sense of security and trust um, but again, I want to talk a little bit about why making starts here. Um, it, yes, I do have a, a blender in my classroom. Um, <laughs> uh, food is that thing that connects us all, right? Well, we can agree with that. So how many of us are bringing that into our regular classroom environment? It's, it's the center of all cultures, of all races, of our religion, of all of our religions, um, our spiritual uh, spirituality, who we are, food will be part of that. We know that research shares that in any learning space, makerspaces included, developing this community of learners, it allows us to take risks and bringing this conversation of food in is pretty valuable. Um, I, I wanna also ask you, I, Actually, before I do, I just want to say um, that think about um, that food or, you know, how people are bringing in food, they're bringing a little bit of themselves into that environment, right? A little bit of their culture um, are bringing. So it's something that that's what's something we endeavored in the classroom. But I wanted to ask you what, what you think about your kitchen table at home you know, or your, your island or wherever you meet with your family. Um, you know, for me, it's like our keys get thrown there, the newspapers on that kitchen table, uh, the, you know, it, it's a place where we, where we sit and we have hard conversations, where we cry, uh, where we fight, <laughs> where we have relaxed time eating. Why can't we bring that into the classroom learning environment where, so that kids can have those conversations, those difficult conversations? So it, it, I just want you to think about, you know, what that role 
um, it, what that role of food um, is in the classroom. Um, the, the, the slide that you're seeing right now um, really talks a lot about um, some of the ways that we're integrating it into the curriculum. So creating recipes, um, connecting it to Indigenous, um, looking at the impacting of farming and communities, um, bringing in math concepts, science concepts, food insecurity, uh, financial literacy, um, what does it mean to different people and so on, right? So it's, it, again, you know, you bring it in for that idea of inclusion and um, bringing in that, um, that culture into your classroom, but you can also bring in, bring, easily bring it into um, curriculum as well. <clears throat> Um, are there any like any comments or any thoughts and that you wanted to share in the chat at all? I just want to make sure I'm not going too fast here. I think you're good. We have okay, perfect, a few perfect. questions that we'll want to give time for at the end. I think okay. we're probably at about 10 questions. Beautiful. Okay. Yeah. Um, you're also going to hear me talk a lot about social emotional learning in Ontario's curriculum, and I don't know the curriculum well enough um, in BC to talk to it, but um, we do embed a lot of um, social emotional learning into, um, into our subjects. Math in particular is one, uh, health and phys ed, uh, social studies, and so on. Uh, we bring that in, and of course, it's going to be brought into that makerspace environment. And of course, it's going to be bring, bringing it in our work of, 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 of anti-racism and inclusion. So I, I, I just, I needed to make sure that we talked a little bit about that um, aspect. Um, we also, I, oops, did I, I didn't skip it. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about also the idea of having a profound, do we have a profound um, belief that all ch children are capable of constructing their own learning, um, not just certain students. Um, and, and that's tough, especially when we're talking for some of us, um, you know, we're, we're doing a lot of work right now um, in Ontario on de-streaming. And we ha are beginning to learn, uh, I think we're just at the beginning, that all children do have that uh, capability and that we need to design our learning and our instruction to be able to support them with that. Uh, I also wanted to um, talk a little bit about constructivism versus constructionism, uh, the V, uh, right? So that, a, a, that we talked a little bit about student-centered approaches in makerspaces. And um, Seymour Papert, which was mentioned at the beginning, um, if you don't know Seymour Papert, you should definitely write it down or look, at, at, look Seymour um, up. Um, sadly, he passed away a few years ago, um, tragically, um, but he based his theory on Jean, Jean Piaget's constructivism, um, which is sort of how I center or balance my own practice, where Piaget's constructivism, um, it pro he provided a, a framework for understanding children's ways of doing and thinking at different levels of development, and they were inspired by the belief that their children are not empty vessels to be filled with knowledge, um, but they're active builders of knowledge. That sort of to, knowledge and information um, is not information just to be delivered and encoded and memorized and, and applied at the other end. Um, as we all know, um, knowledge is more of the experience that is acquired through interaction with the world. And this is what I want to show you a little bit with the preceding slides. So Papert kind of talks a little bit about as little scientists who are constantly creating and testing their own theories of the world. Um, I personally find it um, quite interesting. I'm going to share some of my approaches in, a, um, in the preceding slides um, in regards to inquiry and project and problem based learning um, that um, the, I, my belief that if we're going to engage in, an, in a truly inclusive classroom environment that we need to put our family and our community and our culture at the center of that, that should be the basis and that then is it that's enriched and nurtured at school. And that way, again, we're being culturally responsive. 
Um, I want to recognize um, that all learning and, and maker spaces should um, look at at least that's I think that a lot of us are already doing um, doing work in environmental education and recognize human impact that we've had on Earth, but also look at our human impact um, in in relations from our culture to look looking at the human impact to countries who are may not be doing as well as we are and and bringing in um, the word empathy and all of this. So are you thinking about the other thing is, are you, in, in your approach to classroom design and classroom learning spaces and maker spaces, are you looking at just your students as they are that you have in front of you, or are you looking at a more long term approach? Um, it, just just something to think about right when you're doing that. OK, so here's I'm going to show you kind of a cool example that I, I thought so um, we that at least that I think it's kind of cool. So we partnered with a design thinking multi multidisciplinary class at McMaster University a couple of years ago, a few years ago, um, and uh, we framed it with these students. They were all in different um, di disciplines within the university um, and they were taking a course, a project based course, and we framed it um, in a way that how how can you create a classroom environment with an, a fully that is based us on equity, anti-oppression, uh, anti-racism? Um, how are you going to design that environment um, that is inclusive for all? And so they had to go back and talk about it. And the first question we sat, I brought all these students in here. They were in year three, four, uh, probably in their degrees. And we sat in a circle and asked these students, where do you learn best? And interesting, a lot of those students said, you know, like we really talked about just in, in your own personal life, where do you learn the best? And, and a lot of it was, you know, people were being kind of silly at times, but saying things, I don't know if it's silly, but, um, you know, I learn best at the coffee shops. I learn best um, in canoe trips. I learn what best when I'm work when I'm walking in nature. I learn best at home at the kitchen table and so on. And so here's what this space looked like. And then here's the after picture, if you um, if you can get it. So. Um, so just sort of taking a look at um, some of the artifacts and so on in that space, that's just, that was sort of just a little bit of our beginning, right? So here's the before and here's the after. Um, and how is that space in itself? And something I'm like, how is that anti, you know, racist or anti oppressive space? But it's a space that we sort of talked with the students to get all of their ideas um, in terms of what mattered to them, right? Their lived experience and so on. So I'm just gonna go on here. So here's the other half of the room with this particular project of building this space is the maker space. And then here's what it looked like after. So beginning and then end. Um, I wanted to point out um, uh, that uh, one of the really cool, one of my favorite space and anyone can do it is, was the whole use of natural light inspiring um the workspace under the window so we kind of you can see in this picture here there's a little bit of a ledge and um it, it was an interesting um it, it was it was um interesting in that students would use that ledge to sort of escape for, even though they weren't escaping right they were physically still there but that ledge they could look out the window and they can be somewhere else if they needed to be uh, just by looking out the window so i want to i'm just moving on this is the middle of the same room so when we created this space you saw the one section and then the back and then this is the middle can anybody take a wild guess what they think this is going to become in the next slide anybody want to throw it out there <laughs> I guess I can't see the chat, so I don't really know if you're saying yes or no, but <laughs> nothing's coming through. Nothing. OK, well, I think you're probably thinking because if you were listening to my previous slides, but um, it is it, it, yes, it becomes the kitchen, right? It can, becomes that space where people can talk and collaborate and be who and, and bring in their their own um, their own life, right? So all of this might seem like great, like well, let's see it in action. And this was a a, a big part of um, this this particular. Um, sorry, I'm just gonna. Are there any questions or anything like that at all? 
No, not yet. We have about okay. 12 more minutes left. Okay. So. okay, thank you. So the words you see here, um, a lot of this were students um, coming up with ideas um, and principles and views and worldviews that were that were connected to them, uh, that connected to their lives so that we could have those conversations. And if I bring um, a lot of this right now, this is what we would, we would talk about when we first would start in a maker activity and what, what, what sort of they were basing some of their own, um, you know, what, where they wanted to focus on. And some kids, it depended on the day. Some kids were looking at um, the significance of balance or interaction with communities or respecting traditional knowledge or so on. But this was a bit of a combination between a lot, a lot of, um, a, a lot of layers, I guess you could, you could say in that case. I just wanted to share a little bit about of that. Um, so I'm back to this because in this picture you see right here, this is what we would be talking about. This is what we might be thinking about. And even if you're in this presentation right now, what is it that's bringing um, that's bringing thoughts or feelings? What is it that you care about? What is it that something that you are um, strongly passionate about um, that can enhance that anti-racist uh, and equity work? Um, it isn't just talking about the issues that we know that are impacting all of us, but it's diving deep. And this is the deep dive that we're talking about. So it, it brings us a little bit to the whole concept of critical literacy um, in learning. So I just wanted to, I'm just going to leave this up for a second, just so that you can see, just have a chance to read it. Okay, uh, so <laughs> this picture right here that, um, that you see, this was one of my favorite lessons, um, a makerspace lesson, uh, because it really had kids diving into the um, idea of inclusion from the idea of, from the concept of their own community. And so the little makers that were in my room, the, the little students that were there, they were, um, they were totally engaged in making based on criteria, using UN sustainable development goals, all sorts of things that uh, mattered to them looking at those goals. But in the end, when they all um, in small groups, they had some criteria, certain groups had different communities. We had this huge space that they could um, add their, their builds to. But in the end, um, they they started talking about no, I don't want, I don't want the, the the jail there. I want it. It needs to go into that community. And and we look at communities that had uh, that were a little bit um, that were more populated. We looked at communities that had more trees. We looked at communities that had um, that were facing um, struggle in terms of. Um, you know, space, you know, I mean, all sorts of issues came up, but it came up because they were constructing their learning within that makerspace and they had that bigger, that bigger idea or the bigger concept of, um, you know, versus just the build, right? They were, they were making meaning, kind of what we were talking about with um, Seymour Papert there. So it, it kind of, so I just wanted to kind of share a little bit about, um, about that, but that, that wasn't just, just the physical, arts and crafts in this picture, it brings us a little bit to the bringing it to their own personal life. And so then students would go in and look at their community compared to other communities. And this is important when we're again looking at anti-racism and oppression because it starts with community, right? It's, it's what we're doing in education is bringing community into our learning environment. So we need to make sure that we're having these community conversations. So here's students looking at maps, uh, discussing issues involving community. There was a highway that was put through, um, separating student, this one student from their um, from their friends um, from stores. And so we were looking at ways we can design um, online, we can design a diff bridges and so on. And in this uh, particular picture you see here, it, same sort of thing, kids looking at their very community with the school and how can you can see the pictures right there are a little bit different the befores and after, and then how they can bring in, how they can make that school part of them. The, the community that you're looking at right now in the school is a community that 
faces a lot of um, difficulty. It's an inner city environment. Um, there's a lot of poverty, um, things going on in, um, in terms of racism. So we were trying to enhance that community for so that people living there could feel more joy and so on. And you can, and the benefit, the beauty of this example that I'm showing you or sharing with you right now is that this actually happened um, in the end. Um, the, the, there's no green roof on it, unfortunately, but the, the school did um, transform their environment. So I'm going to skip through a couple of things just to show you, but using Minecraft helped us um, have students get into that world of, um, of connecting to other people, connecting to other cultures and so on. And so in this case, uh, it's how do we balance in the world? How do we give back? And that kind of question can be environmental, but it can also look at some of the work we're doing um, in the makerspace. Um, here, the students were having to we're using the, the makerspace in Minecraft to construct um, areas that they would maybe reinvent that have been destroyed by humans. And we would often use um, in all of our makerspace uh, topics and all of our makerspace challenges, we're going to use big ideas, questions, having kids think deeply about those and make personal connections, but connections to other people as well and bringing on bringing them to that level of empathy that they need to have so that they aren't racist as they grow up. Uh, right, that, that that works. So this was an interesting one that we did a few years ago, where the students were looking at um, the concept of barriers, right? Um, so yes, we were looking at some of the um, ideas that uh, some of the things that happened during the Cold War. But, um, and of course, that that impacts what's happening right now in the world, but it that it took it to a whole other level of barriers, who has barriers? Right? Um, those students, other people, how do we get rid of those barriers? And, and it leads us into other kinds of lessons, like lessons with textiles, right? Um, how do we um, redefine what it means to be a consumer? So are the kids going to sew and knit and crochet? Absolutely. But are they going to do it understanding communities that are doing it um, in, uh, in oppressed environments? And if we can get them to understand that, then they're going to start making, um, taking those call to actions for change. So I realize I only have a couple of minutes left. So um, I'm again, a couple of different pictures. So again, you see, this is a picture of um, a sort of a little bit of a different than what we would have been talking about with some of the say sweatshops, right? But students needed to physically actively engage in that making um, in order to, to bring themselves to that, that level of conversation. And prior to any of that happening, we would have had those relationship building moments and so on. Um, in the end, I want you to, to remember that wherever making happens is a maker space. And that includes going out into the community, right? So, may, so where does making actually happen? Get them to know what's happening in the community, getting them to talk to people in the community. And here's the students take go from their makerspace and go into the field and get to share and feel empathy and build relationships and understand that um, their perspectives in the community um, may be only one of many. And um, looking at archives and looking at um, buildings um, that, that may have uh, cultural or religious significance and why they need to be protected and why they're important for some. Um, talking to people who are actually making in their real world, real life, right? This man was a, a man I've gotten to know because he doesn't mind when I bring my students there randomly um, to talk to him about his experience moving from his country to Canada and then creating his own business. And the wooden bowls you see there was from someone selling meat pies, but in the behind their meat pies was them making and creating. And why? Why would they do that and hide them? And the kids sort of got to understand learning and culture from uh, the perspective of community. And I think I'm going to sort of end here because this, this was sort of an addition to the presentation, um, a big part of making and community action and for 
um, makers is bringing in play. And, and so I, I don't really need to go into sort of the pedagogy or the practice of play, but many, there's a lot of research out there that talk about, that talks about um, the, the value of play into your environment. And um, I hope I could share that with you another time, but I'm gonna skip through everything except for this one quote, because it's one of my favorite, is how can we bring the opposite of depression into everyday life? And that is when people who have experienced racism and equity ish, um, and oppression, um, all of those kinds of things, what are we doing to making sure that we're lifting them and that we're bringing wellness um, in as the center of all of what we're doing um, before we're getting into that making. And so to go on, the final thing that I'm going to um, put in, uh, the very, very final thing is uh, my, I wanted to share my big discomfort with all of this um, was adapting to the fact that I love schedules. I'm very scheduled and scripted. And even this presentation, I scripted and I practiced a little bit, even though I'm not necessarily following it at this point. But I'm, um, you can see the one schedule you see on the on the green on the chalkboard is from my earlier days of teaching. And then the one you see on the right, where you could kind of see is like robotics, guitar lessons, coding, and so on. And that's me now. And it's so stressful and uncomfortable to kind of have a lesson that is just an open choice lesson and getting kids to do what they need um, to that responds to them and, and their learning. And I had to really change in order to make that happen. And I'm still adjusting. And so I want you to think about how your space would be different if you were to create a space that was truly uh, equitable, um, truly responded to our call to action for anti-racism and anti-oppression. This is my current classroom. Three years, I have not had it because of the pandemic and I was able to create this environment this year and I'm very excited to be there. So thank you guys, everyone that's in this room for being here and uh, um, listening and sharing in the chat. Thank you so much, Zoe. That was so amazing for this presentation and unpacking anti-racism and inclusion through makerspaces. And it's amazing. We were speaking earlier um, before we let the, the group in about how different each of these anti-racism speakers series presentations are and how they appeal to different audiences and different individuals and challenging people to get outside their comfort zone to really um, push past the idea, even if they're not educators in the healthcare or in the government or in um, different sectors. So thank you for giving us this amazing food for thought and having us consider our own biases, our approaches, our next steps. This slide deck for everyone will be available on our website. Um, as well as the recorded version for everybody to be able to see. And as we mentioned prior to it, the session, our initial everything that we're doing within this anti-racism speaker series is to move past the idea of talk and discourse to action. So we invite everybody to participate in action, creating lesson plans, workshops, um, podcasts, conversations with colleagues, uh, really critical discussion topics, and submit those to us on uh, hashtag UBC Met Anti Racism. And we also thank Edith Lando as you can present and, and create some type of call to action yourselves where we will investigate this and there is some funding to go out for the design of digital learning resources based on Zoe's content. So thank you very much. Um, what we are going to do at this part, just seeing um, our timing and everybody who is uh, in this session, I'm thinking that maybe what we want to do, if it's okay with you, Zoe, and Dr. Khan, you know, we can talk about it as well. If we want to send you the list of questions, and if you would mind um, maybe answering some of those, and we can post those on our site for everyone. Awesome idea. I think. <laughs> How would you feel about that, Dr. Khan? Thank you. This makes a lot of sense. Perfect. Perfect. So why don't we, first of all, thank you so much for that presentation. And we also wanted to just give a brief overview of our next presentation next month. 
Um, and I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Khan. Thank you, Carrie. MET continues our anti-racism speaker series next month, where we will welcome BC's Human Rights Commissioner, Kasari Govender. Commissioner Govender will be addressing the notion that the time for debate about whether systemic racism exists in policing is over, particularly but not exclusively as it affects Indigenous and Black people in BC. As the commissioner, she feels that it's time to act. In the fall of 2021, BC's Office of the Human Rights Commissioner released the most comprehensive analysis of policing and arrest data in BC's history, alongside recommendations about reforms to address the disturbing pattern of discrimination revealed in the data. In her talk, Commissioner Govender will speak about the report and her ongoing calls for immediate and sustained action to reform policing in BC. We hope that you can join us on November 24th from 5 to 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time for this presentation. We're going to share the link right now for you to register for this event, or the registration link is also up on the MET website under the top tab, Anti-Racism. So again, we will be posting those questions to our website. Thank you everyone so much for attending and for being interactive in the chat. Thank you, Zoe, very much for walking us through incredible pictures, incredible learning experiences on inclusive making from an anti-racism lens. We very much appreciate it.